So welcome everybody, it's so fantastic to have so many people joining us this evening. It's really exciting to have you all here and we're really excited for this event. Um, it's something Joe and I talked about a little while ago um, about the importance of kind of marking this 20th anniversary of the repeal of Section 28. And we've got three incredible speakers this evening to speak with you and we're so excited they've agreed to join us. And we, what we wanted this event to be was to think about the idea of past, present and future, to think about what Section 28 was and the impact it had on our educational systems at the time, um, to think about its kind of present day impact on our educational systems in terms of the shadow of that and some of the implications, but also with one eye towards the future as we think about what the future might look like in terms of LGBT plus inclusive education in schools. But the reason we are here is for these three incredible speakers this evening. So we are so delighted they've all agreed to join us. Uh, in a moment, we're going to hear from the wonderful Sue Sanders, um, as, who perhaps doesn't need any introduction, but certainly is deserving of one. She's Professor Emeritus. She's the chair of Schools Out UK and the co-founder of LGBT History Month, among her many, many accolades. And she's going to start our <coughs> evening in a moment. We're also joined by the fantastic Professor Paul Baker, who is Professor of English Language at Lancaster University. And uh, many, many, many books and publications. He's the author of Outrageous. Uh, the story of Section 28 and Britain's Battle for LGBT Education, a highly recommended book and very pertinent to this evening. And, of and our final guest is a friend of the show, the brilliant Profess Professor Catherine Lee. Uh, Catherine is Professor of Inclusive Education and Deputy Dean at Anglia Ruskin University. And among her many publications and books, um, she's author of Pretended Schools and Section 28, which we'll be talking about later on. So, um, Without further ado, we're going to get started this evening, and our first speaker is the fantastic Professor Emeritus Sue Sanders. Fantastic. Okay, thanks a lot. It's going to be a bit like COVID because I'm going to be asking them to show my slides because I'm I'm a Zoom person, not Teams. So um, I've been tasked with talking to you about Section 28 of the Local Authority Act of 1988. Given that I'm passionate about history, I wanted to give you the background to it and to show you that the hype around it was a big con. Next slide. We can learn from what happened then to tackle the situation we're in now. And as I can only give you a brief picture here, check out the chapter on the LGBT History Month website that was written by Jill Spraggs and myself at the time. Next slide. During the 80s, there was private and state-sponsored homophobia. It was horrendous. We had no internet and no social media, but the mainstream press, TV and radio were pumping out vicious propaganda. By the mid 80s, the AIDS epidemic was emerging and was dubbed the gay plague. Government sponsored public warnings were appearing on our TVs, implying that if you had gay sex, you would die. No mention was made of the fact that straight sex was also a risk. Over the next 20 years or so, we lost a great deal of our gay men who suffered extreme stigmatization before they got very ill or died. So for those of us who have queer and fringe identities, the whole atmosphere of the decade was terrifying. Next. However, groups of feminists, LGBT, black and disabled people did begin to challenge the local authorities to be more comprehensive and inclusive with their services. This book became famous and was used to whip up the moral majority as the Tories claimed it was in schools. It was not. It was only in one teacher's resource center Labour-run local authorities like Lambeth, Hackney, Camden and Haringey and the Greater London Councils, as well as other Labour-run authorities up and down the country, were being forced to think about serving a more inclusive population. Next. This did not chime easily with the Conservative government, who began to act scared of this gelling of minorities and women. Earl Halsbury gave a speech in 86, and here are some of the quotes which I think really illustrate this. He states that lesbians aren't as harmful, read dangerous, as gay men, and has this extraordinary concept that the loony left is hardening up the lesbians, making us more aggressive. Six. Uh, next, rather. Whereas, in fact, the opposite was true. It was the marginalised groups, including the lesbians, who were hardening up the left. The term loony left was a stereotyping description of socialists, and it was coined by the right wing press. And then some of the Labour politicians began to use it as a derogatory label for people like Ken Livingstone, Linda Bellos and Bernie Grant. It is a sad fact and being repeated now that the Labour leadership did not did little to challenge the bill or the homophobic rhetoric. Next. 
Further on in his speech, Earl Horsbury says that if the Conservatives continue to emancipate minorities, they will push us off the pavement. This is such a telling statement and shows so clearly where the Conservatives are coming from. They want minorities enslaved and off their pavements. Of course, what we've been trying to do all this time is to make a very wide pavement that we can all easily travel along. He put forward a bill which was very similar to what later became Section 28, but at that time it was ignored. Next. Then there was the Conservative election campaign of 1987. As these headlines show, it was viciously sexist and homophobic. Next. The Conservatives put out this advert, attempting to tell people that the Labour Party were going to do dreadful things in schools if elected. Hypocritically, they promised to take the politics out of education, when in fact, the Conservatives planned to pump education with their politics. I think the next Conservative election campaign is going to be worse than that of 87. I want us to learn from the past and be prepared to argue for human rights. If we are to win in the long run, we need to work together and support each other. We must educate people on who we are and recognize that we do have laws in place that protect us. The attacks come from people who are afraid that the pavement will never be wide enough to include them and us and who will lie to get a vote. It is crucial that we keep promoting the truth. Next. Conservatives won the election. And then Section 28 was picked up and put in the Local Authority Act. As people began to hear about it, they began to work together to challenge it. Next. This is a poster that was produced by the arts lobby and the education lobby together. It attempts to warn us that if the Conservatives are allowed to attack LGBT people, then anyone is fair game. Who could be next on their list? This powerful statement about the Nazis of 1938 coming from Pastor Neumiller was making just such links. However, there are two errors in this poster. The Nazis did not kill Pastor Neumiller. He lived until the 1980s. And obviously you'll recognize the misnumbering of the clause. It got various numbers before it was finally called Clause 28. Mistakes happen when you are forced to move fast and with few resources. Next. These posters were produced by Schools Out and the Education Lobby. Notice what we're trying to do here is to get people to recognize the full diversity of the LGBT plus community. The other poster aims at introducing people to what real families were, are. The section was talking about this weird concept of pretended family relationships, and we were challenging that whole concept. Traditional family values were being promoted by the Conservatives, all part of the moral panic, saying that families are so crucial and important, <laughs> but they never defined what a family was. They were determined to promote the upholding of patriarchal domination. Basically, they were hoping that traditional families, that is women, would bear the brunt of all the work that needed to be done because the government was busy cutting funds to benefits, social care, etc leaving women to pick up all the pieces. Next. Lots of people fought against Section 28. Up and down the country, various small groups were set up and formed alliances. Next. They spurred the lesbian and gay community, as we called ourselves then, into action, galvanizing the disparate sections of the British LGBTQ community into more direct and concerted action. Next. Probably the small group that most people know about is the arts lobby. I was working with them and the education lobby as I had worked in theatre as well as being a teacher. We managed to get some publicity about the fact that libraries and theatres that get funded by local authorities might be affected. That they wouldn't be able to put on plays that were written by or about LGBT people or libraries may not be able to hold LGBT books. This particular event was very powerful and galvanized action. Next, you have likely heard about the lesbians who abseiled into the House of Lords when the Section 28 was actually passed. Next, their intentions were to both protest the section and grab the headlines and therefore to get the opportunity to present their arguments against the section. When a group of lesbian activists evaded the news studio, the BBC, while the six o'clock news was on, it was to hold the mainstream press to account 
because people just weren't hearing our side of the story. Next. So let's look at the Local Authority Act of 1988. It was designed to attack equality work so that local authorities who were beginning, as I have said, to plan services to their entire community were stymied. It promoted local authorities. It, pro it prohibited local authorities from choosing their con contractors for goods and services on their employment practices rather than merely on their prices, thus limiting the employment chances of women and minorities. And it was Michael Howard who made it clear what the Tories thought of any anti-discrimination work when he said it was meddling with other people's conduct of their own business. Next. Here is the section itself. And you'll notice the title says Prohibition on Promoting Homosexuality by Teaching or Publishing Material. I will show the section purported to have an authority it did not have. Next. Throughout the whole process of Section 28, going through Parliament, it was noted by various people, as well as the Earl of Caithness, that the provision in the Act was not actually going to affect classroom teaching. This was because of the 1986 Education Act had taken the power of local authorities over schools away from them and given it to the school governors. This was said many times, both in the Commons and the Lords, as recorded in Hansard, but it was ignored and never reported in the press or news media. Next. The National Union of Teachers sent a letter to every school in the country making it clear that Section 28 did not affect the teaching in schools. Next. A head teacher actually said that he was going to continue the LGBT work they were doing in his school. The Department of Education's personal social and health team said it didn't affect classroom teaching. Throughout the 15 years, Schools Out held annual conferences for LGBT teachers and their allies and produced numerous resources for visualizing and usualizing LGBT people as well as resources for tackling homophobic bullying. It is important to note that we never ever had any prosecutions in England and Wales using Section 28, the whole of those 15 years it was law. Next. So those 15 years of hell, of homophobic attacks and fear of openness was actually unnecessary. Section 28 also includes this now famous but horrendous phrase, pretended family relationships, which was a massive attack on lesbians and gay men who had children and those of us who were looking after family members. The word family became a really contaminated word for many of us. Next. The act is finally repealed in Scotland in June 2000. And after several attempts in England and Wales, it goes in 2003. Next. Did it, legal, did it legalize prejudice? Well, it attempted to. It built an atmosphere and a culture of homophobia, legitimizing prejudice and hateful behavior, which is of course where we are now with trans rights. Next. We now have the big con about what's happening with trans issues. Ministers and the press constantly promulgating lies and misleading statements, which are being picked up by social media, creating this miasma against trans people as well as an increase in hate crime against them. It is crucial to recognize that nothing has changed legally. We can continue to do all the work that we want to do to support our trans siblings. The Equality Act is still intact. We need to be clear what our rights are and promote them and not repeat the lies or fall into victim thinking. Next. Let us leave it to the bigots to do their own dirty work while we continue to build that wide pavement so we can all travel along it to a place where we can all be safe, celebrated and enjoy our human rights. Thank you so much, Sue, for starting us off there. That was an excellent kind of history of the context of Section 28, but also made relevant to the experiences that we're having in education at the moment. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Baker. 
Um, Paul Baker is the author and researcher of some brilliant books, um, Fabulosa, the story of Polari, Britain's secret gay language. More recently, Camp, the story of the attitude that conquered the world. And most relevant to our conversation tonight, um, Outrageous, the story of Section 28 and Britain's battle for LGBT education. Um, as soon as we kind of read that book and became aware of it, we wanted to have Paul on the show. So there is an episode of our podcast where we discuss that book at length. So it's um, um, great to have you join us again this evening, Paul for this event. So I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, brilliant. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Adam. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe's parents. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the effects of 28, looking at its impact on the arts and media and on education and on custody cases. And also I'll talk a bit about the ways that LGBTQ plus people responded to it and the kind of birth of the, the kind of modern gay rights movement that we, we have now. And I want to start with arts and culture and in particular the picture that emerged in the decade or so after section 28 came into law was one of funding cuts and cancellations for lgbtq plus artists and performers and i've just got a couple of examples um, to kind of demonstrate that um, so one casualty was the bristol-based avon touring theater which was forced to close after it lost its funding in 1989 um, the company had been banned from performing a play called Trapped in Time at a local school um, because one of the characters was gay, shock horror, and came out to his friends. And, and because of Section 28, that play was banned and then they lost their funding the following year as a result. Um, another theatre group that lost its funding, had to disband, was called Gay Sweatshop. Um, and its artistic director, David Benedict, said the funding, funding was pulled due to covert discrimination over Section 28. A related area is in art. Um, so an example would be in 1990, the artists um, Sunil Gupta and Tessa Boffin created an exhibition called Ecstatic Antibodies, which was about representations of AIDS in the UK. And it was going to take place in Salford at the Viewpoint Photography Gallery and contracts had been signed, educational material had been created. And then right at the 11th hour, the booking was cancelled and the acting director of the gallery was told that if she spoke to her press, she would lose her job. Now, in other cases, works that had this kind of content were allowed to go ahead, but they were changed. And one that I remember very well, because I was watching this um, aged 15 and stayed at very late at night to watch it with the sound turned down on the TV while my parents were in bed. Um, this was a, um, a film called Two of Us, which the BBC showed, and it was intended to be part of the their school's daytime series. So it was going to go out sort of during, during sort of school hours. It was about a relationship between two teenage boys of school leaving age. There was a, a massive kind of furore in the tabloid press over it. Um, and as a result, um, the BBC um, kind of directors decided to, to show it at 11 o'clock at night. Um, and I remember yeah, I did stay up to watch it. And it had a very strange ending, um, which seemed to imply that one of the boys went back to a girlfriend and the other boy was left all by himself and got nothing. And I, I, I found that just very strange to see it kind of I, that was not the ending I was hoping to see. And it was because the last minute of the film had been cut um, where the boys did actually end up happily ever after together. And the messaging, I think, from the BBC was very clear that if you must be gay, you're not going to get a happy ending. That's not to say that every television channel was cowed by Section 28 and Channel 4 responded to it by creating a series called Out on Tuesday, um, which I also watched. Its editor, Mandy Merck, said that if young people were watching and wanted to learn about gay lifestyles, then they would find out. And I certainly did. So I don't I think that Section 28 didn't stop every case of theatre or artwork, but it did embolden maybe homophobic people at the time, giving them excuse to cancel things or pull funding if they wanted to. And as a result, there was scarcely any LGBTQ plus themed content aimed at young people in the years after Section 28, all the way through the 90s and then most of the early 2000s as well. And, and many people grew up in a state of ignorance. Next slide, please, Joe. And it was really in the schools where the main damage was done and I think continues to be done. I think there still is a legacy of homophobia, which is caused by Section 28, even though it has been abolished um, for quite a long time. It created an atmosphere of fear and silence. Um, and part of this, I think, was because of the wording. Um, and I've put some little bits and bold there, just um, some, of the, some of the more problematic um, kind of words and phrases there. I mean, how do you even promote 
the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. The wording's inaccurate. Homosexuality is a sexuality, it's not a relationship. So you can't really interpret that because it just doesn't make sense. Um, and what does promote mean anyway? How do you promote something? Um, you know, advertisers spend a lot of money, um, you know, pr promoting products and things like that. Um, it's very difficult to know whether they're successful or not. So how do you actually promote homosexuality? In those days, you couldn't go online and get up the wording of the law. And people then had a very vague idea about what the law actually meant as a result. They had a vague idea it meant homosexuality you know, wasn't really something the government approved of and shouldn't get mentioned. And I think that was more really what, what the intention of it was. It was more to kind of give off a message um, to scare people in, into kind of censoring themselves. And people were afraid of being the test case um, of getting the names in the newspapers or losing their jobs. So there was an awful lot of self-censorship that went on. Um, next slide, please. The teacher called Tim Puntus has described how Section 28 normalised homophobia after it became law. Um, homophobia in schools reached the worst levels that he'd known of since 1967. And homophobic bullying became rife in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, I've put a selection of quotes from a few well-known LGBTQ plus faces there regarding individual experiences. Um, so Davina and Chris talk about the physical bullying that happened to them, you know, being spat on, shoved, called names, having drinks thrown at them, generally having your life made, made miserable day after day. And schools had very confused or non-existing policies around homophobic bullying, and teachers felt that their, you know, their hands were tied to confront it. Patrick there mentions the lack of any relevant safe sex education, and Beth asks where if she'd had more support, she would have maybe wouldn't have missed school so much, um, and maybe she that wouldn't have you know would have impacted um, less on her exam results. Next slide, please. Just put there are a few studies which show the impact of Section 28, and these are quite a bit later. In fact, a couple of them are actually after Section 28 has been repealed, and they kind of tell you about this kind of legacy, this long term impact that it had. Um, a survey in 1999 by Douglas et al. looked at teachers in 307 secondary schools in England and Wales and found almost universal awareness of homophobic bullying. More than 25% of teachers said they were aware of physical bullying. You know, actually hitting and, um, and pushing and things like that. Another study um, of LGBT pupils by Stonewall in 2007, so that's um, four years after it was repealed, just shows how toxic the atmosphere was and how it had left a legacy that was difficult to shift with 65% of LGBT plus pupils experiencing direct bullying, 60% have heard phrases like that's so gay at school. I actually hear that sometimes. I used to hear that at my university sometimes as well. Um, 97% have heard of the phrases like puff, dyke or bender, often or frequently. Only 23% had been told that homophobic bullying was wrong at their school. And the study of 2000 teachers in 2009 found that 90% of secondary school teachers and 44% of primary school teachers reported that children and young people regularly experienced homophobic bullying, name calling or harassment. Half of those said that the vast majority went unreported. 90% of teachers had received no specific training on how to prevent or respond to that kind of bullying. And 28% of staff said they would not be confident in supporting a child who came out to them. Next slide, please. And because Section 28 referred to gay families as pretended family relationships, during the late 80s and, and the 90s, some judges were very hostile in their attitudes toward lesbian mothers in custody cases. And in some cases, women had to hide their sexuality in their relationships. They were scared they would lose their children. Um, a lawyer called Jill Butler, who specialised in custody cases in that period, um, described how one judge said that homosexuality wasn't natural and banned a mother from having contact with other, other lesbians. Um, Jill Butler said that all of the custody cases that she'd been involved in had involved cases where the judges had asked detailed questions to women about their sex lives, completely inappropriate. And typical questions included, will you have sex in front of your children? Do you make a noise when you have sex? And do you use appliances? And with the latter, one woman reportedly replied, we've got a hoover. But I want to spend the last few minutes um, that I have by noting um, another um, unintended and much more positive consequence of Section 28. And that was how it inspired action which would contribute hugely towards the formation of the modern day LGBTQ plus rights movement. 
Yeah. It's really hard to describe how big the protest movement was against Section 28 and how it involved such a wide range of different types of people, as Sue has mentioned, kind of coming together, as well as a, a kind of a very wide range of different ways of protesting, too. Um, my favourites, really, um, are, the, are the kind of very high profile protests which involved imaginative, non-violent direct action carried out by women, such as the evasion of the House of Lords that Sue mentioned during one of the key votes. Um, several women um, went into the House of Lords and um, they had clothesline wrapped around their waists. And during a, a key vote, they um, tied the clothesline to a balcony and then descended, causing pandemonium and making news headlines. Next slide. And women from the same network also got the news in a much more literal way by invading the BBC One's live six o'clock news on May the 23rd, 1988, which was also my 16th birthday. And it was really one of the nicest birthday presents I think that I ever received. And these kind of protests helped to raise awareness about Section 28, as well as sending a message to the government that people weren't going to sit by and let this happen without fighting back. Next slide. There were massive marches in cities and towns in the UK. Um, one of the most famous of these was the Never Going Underground event, which took place in Manchester on 20th of February 1988, with over 20,000 attendees. And I think, ironically, the Section 28 protest caused gay people to meet up, make new friends, exchange ideas, have fun and even fall in love. And um, the MP, one of the MPs at the time, Chris Smith, he told me that he met his partner of 24 years after their eyes met across um, a crowded committee room in the Commons during one of the campaign meetings. And the main impression I get from looking at photos of all these marches and rallies and meetings was emotions like happiness and pride rather than anger and despair. And as a result, Section 28 inspired many people to come out of the closet to unite in protest. And at this gradually helped to change the attitudes of the wider population of the UK. Because I think it's much harder to be homophobic about somebody if you if they're telling you that they're gay and they're a member of your family or they're a friend. OK, next slide, please. And ultimately, Section 28 was an important inspiration for the creation of two high profile groups in the early 90s, Stonewall and Outrage. They both had quite different methods. They quite they differed in terms of their specific goals as well, I think. Um, although I think they had a kind of overarching similar goal. And I think it was a good strategy to have these two different groups. It makes the the kind of opposition towards sec against Section 28 harder to respond to because it's so multifaceted and it allows for a wider range of participation. Um, more people can kind of join in. Stonewall amassed a great deal of evidence and survey data about homophobic bullying in schools. They helped get lots of major institutions on board, including the nation's agony ants, um, Angela Mason told me. And they were able to take cases of discrimination to the high courts, helping to overturn other homophobic laws like the ban on serving in the armed forces. Outrage started a debate about closeted people who supported homophobic laws. They handed out safe sex um, literature outside school gates as well on gay sex. Um, and I think Outrage were instrumental in getting the Anglican Church to change its official policy on homosexuality. So. Ultimately, I think the consequences of Section 28 were incredibly damaging, and particularly for young people, for, for, for um, same-sex families and, and for the arts and theatre. But I think we should see it more as one step backwards in the short term um, and two steps forward in the long term. Thank you so much, Paul. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm really, really grateful for that presentation. Um, we're going to have a few minutes of questions now in a second as well. So if you'd like to think of any questions or quotes of Paul, you're welcome to pop those in the chat bar or to virtually put your hand up. But I'll just say thank you again. I think what you've done there is bring to life what Section 28 looked like in the in the minutiae, in the day to day. And that's been so helpful and valuable for us to think about. I think the headline, Beeb Man Sits on Lesbian, is still one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Um, but also, I, I, I really like the nuance you brought through in that story there, because obviously we know that Section 28 it was a really pernicious and really kind of um, devastating piece of legislation. But to think about some of the positives that have come from that, I think is really hopeful for us to think about as we go towards the future as well. Now I'm going to move on to uh, Catherine as our final speaker for the evening. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Catherine uh, to speak this evening. Um, I'm not going to say too much about Catherine's work because I know she's going to talk about it within her presentation now, but I just want to say um, Catherine does incredible writing, uh, thinking, publishing around LGBT plus inclusion. There's some really fantastic books and publications that Catherine has hopefully, hopefully will signpost you to in a moment, but we strongly encourage you to read those because they're really exceptional pieces of work. So Catherine, thank you so much and we'll hand over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, brilliant to, uh, to, to, 
be here tonight um, with Paul and Sue, um, both heroes of mine. I think they've really foregrounded what I want to talk about, which is a very personal story, really, really well and set out um, the political and, and social and cultural kind of um, it sort of atmosphere of, of the time. But what I'm going to talk about is what Section 28 felt like for me as a as a teacher and I have the the, the dubious accolade of having um, taught for every single year of section 28 so um, what I'm going to talk about is is very much based on my own experiences and I think it's important to caveat that my 22 years that I spent in um, in teaching was spent in predominantly in two areas. One was in the um, the Catholic sector in in a city, Liverpool, in a convent school, and then in um, deepest darkest rural Suffolk, where um, I wasn't in faith schools, but um, the the school kind of environments that I were in were very very um, small C and probably large C conservative. So. Um, my story isn't everybody's story, but I know it is a story that will um, resonate with others. Uh, next slide, please, Adam or Joe. So a little bit about who I am. So um, I grew up in um, in South Yorkshire. I that little girl in her Umbro football kit there. Um, I don't think I could have ever, ever believed that we would all be watching the lionesses win the euros and singing sweet caroline um i wanted to be kevin keegan if anybody can um can can remember kevin keegan um that that was the only role model i had um i was sporty followed suit that um i would go and be a pe teacher um i wasn't particularly that good at sport but um i didn't know anybody that was gay I knew from probably my mid-teens that I was gay the only people I suspected might be gay were my own PE staff at school so um, off I went to Liverpool to train to be a teacher and in 1988 I started um, started my my career um, at St Julie's High School for girls and um, my entire senior leadership team were nuns, so very, very conservative um, government. But so I, I entered teaching and uh, Mrs Thatcher's Section 28 and Sue's told us all about what that is, entered teaching at the very same time. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. So what did it mean for us, for those of us that were, were teachers? Well, I know I've written about this. And I know from Paul's brilliant book, he's written about this too. Um, the wording, you know, Sue went through the wording of Section 28 and as did Paul. We didn't know what it meant. We didn't know how to stay. All of us that were teachers didn't know how to stay the right side of Section 28 because of this vague, protracted, odd wording. So. We were all confused about what we could and couldn't say to young people about about sexuality. So we didn't say anything. Um, so ultimately, there's a whole generation of young people who went to school through those 15 years of Section 28. who didn't get any support unless a teacher really went out on a limb for, for them and really you, you know, stuck their neck out. They got no support. They didn't see people like them in the curriculum they, they there was literally nothing um because section 28 was a local government act then there was no funding permitted for any lgbt groups or communities so any help outside school was was non-existent for young people and those of us well i'm saying those of us certainly um me and my um, my friends and, and partner at the time believed that we couldn't talk about our own personal relationships in school because if we did, we'd lose our job. So, you know, and certainly if we were outed in the school workplace, our position would be an untenable. So it really led um, me to, to lead very much a double life and expend a ton of energy 
at that bit where the personal and and the professional kind of kind of meet and you know we're all at our best aren't we when we can be ourselves and when you're trying to manage who you are in, in teaching which is a demanding job anyway um you know it's a lot uh, next slide please so what did it mean? What did Section 28 mean for me day to day? So this is this is the bit where I shamelessly plug my book. Um, my book is based in, on large parts and uh, large part um, on some diaries. I kept a diary on and off when uh, I, I was a teacher and I wrote about my experiences as a teacher um, during Section 28. And it's it's those diaries that that form um form a, a major part of, of of the book so that i was in a pretended family relationship i lived with another woman um but pretended pretending became my kind of mo really for um for my time as a teacher and they're just some of the ways there that i pretended i pretended to live on my own uh so i completely you know never spoke to anybody in the staff room about the girlfriend that I had at home. When um, when those nuns um, in my senior leadership team decided I wasn't getting any younger and I ought to uh, join the Catholic Ramblers and my, meet a nice, uh, a nice young man, I, I pretended very swiftly to, to have a boyfriend. Um, people always described me as a private person. And, they, and I was pretending to be a private person. I was always kind of two sentences ahead of myself, ready to sort of flip any questions that, that anybody might ask me at school. Um, I tended not to be ambitious or interested in school leadership because I, you know, that came. I, I always think being a head teacher is a bit like being a celebrity without the money. And, and it's kind of it was very much like that to be a to be a head teacher in a school community comes with a level of visibility and and kind of um a platform really of of being the, the head of something that with the same sex partner i just couldn't ever have have sort of and just just like just couldn't have navigated that and um the last two things are things that i'm hugely ashamed of and probably have spent my life beyond school kind of atoning for really and you know if I thought a young person might be about to come out to me I always pretended I was too busy to listen to them I would be the first to help any young person if they came to be with any other sort of thing that they wanted to discuss but I couldn't risk going there and if I heard homophobic language in this in in the corridors at school I, I just pretended I didn't hear it again I'd be the first to wade in if uh, if I thought that a young person was uh, having a tough time for for another reason um so I kept a diary that kind of um that kind of talked about all these um experiences and in one of those diary entries I talked about a Saturday night when I thought my career in teaching had ended. Um, myself and my girlfriend, we had a couple of friends to stay and we went to our local lesbian bar and um, I could feel somebody watching our group. We were around the pool table and I could feel somebody watching our, our group and I looked up and there was somebody from my, um, my netball team, six former from my netball team um, in the lesbian bar. Um, we left and I thought that that would be the end of me. I thought that when Monday morning came and I went to school, Sister Kevin Mary O'Brien, who was the uh, the head teacher at the time, would summon me to her office and it would be all around the school that I was in a lesbian bar and because of Section 28, I would uh, lose my job. That absolutely isn't what happened, quite the opposite. Um, but I look back and was far from the role model I wish I'd have been able to be for that young person when uh, when she did come to see me at school um, the next day. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, um, I, as many of you know, I've worked at Anglia Ruskin, um, and one of um, one of the, I thought, you know, I'm not the only person who's been deeply affected by this thing called Section 28, because I still think it um, affects me today. So I did a survey um, with other teachers um, who identified as LGBTQ, and I compared the responses of those teachers that were teaching, I say now, 2017, I collected the data, who had um, first hand experience of Section 28 and were still um, still teaching in schools in 2017, compared with LGBT teachers who had only joined the profession after 2003 when Section 28 was repealed. And they're just a couple of the, the, the sort of stats, really. So um, only 18%, this is in 2017 with the Equality Act and equal marriage and everything else, only 18% of Section 28 teachers, I called them Section 28 if they'd been teaching during that era, were out to, um, to staff and students compared with nearly half of those teachers that joined after Section 28 was repealed. And almost half of the Section 28 teachers at some point in their career had accessed help for anxiety and depression linked to either their sexual gender ident identity and critically their work as a teacher. So really troubling figures. Next slide, please. I'm going to cheer you all up now, though. Um, so in 2018, I was um, the research that I've just shared with you had been published in an article, and these two um, impossibly young, cool people got in touch with me and said, "Oh, we've um, we've 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 seen your article. Uh, you've done some research on Section 28, and um, we're going to try and um, get some funding for a film about um, Section 28. Could we talk to you?" So I said. Yeah, of course. Um, so I met with them and they told me about their plans and they thought that they would get um, get some funding for this this feature film about Section 28. So I said, oh, what's it about? They said, oh, we're thinking of basing it on um, a lesbian PE teacher in the north of England um, in, in, in Section 28. So I sort of went, oh. I was a lesbian PE teacher in the north of England. So anyway, our conversation then took a very different turn. And I remembered, I remembered the diaries that I'd, uh, that, that I'd kept. So um, I, I remember coming off the call and, and thinking, hang on, they think they're going to get funding for a film about Section 28. I'll never hear from them again. Who, want, who wants to watch a film about Section 28? That can only be the most niche thing ever. Um, but I sent them I sent them my diaries and um, and that was that. So um, next slide, please. So fast forward to 2021 and I get um, this email from the producer, Helen, to say um, they'd been funded by the BBC and the BFI. And um, my um, my story had uh, particularly of meeting the the sixth former in the in the in the gay bar during section 28 had been used um as a focus for the film and um they wanted me to advise on the on the script and would i could they employ me to be an advisor on set would i like to be a supporting artist which is um extra to you and me and um yeah i think if so fast forward to 2022 and um, off I go to the north of England. Um, there I am on set um, with the incredible Rosie McEwen, who plays Jean, the, uh, the, the lesbian PE teacher, with the uh, fantastic young actors and netballers that played, uh, played the kids. And I was kind of in this, um, it, was, it was the most surreal, I mean, yes, it was bags of fun, but I hadn't expected it to affect me as profoundly as it did. And, you know, there was um, just the language that um, the young people were using. There's a, there's a scene where a couple of kids 
call each other. One of them calls another one dyke. And I hadn't heard that word for so long, yet it was so sort of typical of that era. And I'm 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 in. It was it was very much a sort of Ebenezer Scrooge type moment where I'd literally been transported back into the 80s. Everybody was, you know, wearing what I wore and this gym was just kind of exactly as it had been in the 1980s. And um, and it, it was, I saw Rosie and, you know, I'd spent hours with Rosie before shooting started and I talked to her about being feeling all the time like I was a deer in the headlights, you know, that I I was always a couple of sentences ahead in case I was going to accidentally out myself or somebody would say something to me that would be, um, in, you know, that would that would ask me about my private life. And, and I saw Rosie as Jean kind of embody all of this um, on set and knowing when the hindsight is as Sue mentioned you know not one teacher was ever prosecuted as a consequence of section 28 and and looking back you know thinking about that wording that you know as as Paul's just talked us through you know, it was unenforceable and I'd lived half a life you know I have really lived half a life um and so it it was it was yeah much more difficult than than I had um, ever expected it to be but there I am in my brine nylon black and cream um, tracksuit playing it having my big moment I think I'm in it for three seconds playing uh, the away team PE teacher opposite Rosie which uh, was absolutely absolutely brilliant so I've just talked about how troubling it was and what a difficult difficult time it was to be on set but then then they invited me to the world premiere of Blue Jean in Venice so I kind of um it was it was very much a silver lining to uh to what had been a, a difficult a difficult few months I got to uh to join the cast and crew um have our red carpet um moment to uh to breathe in the same air as Timothy Chalamet and Kate Blanchett and it was like something I had uh, never ever ever thought I would experience so uh it just super super positive so after our world premiere in Venice we then next slide please um went to London and uh and did it all over again in in London and that picture on the left hand side I really love that that's um Kerry Hayes who plays um um, Jean's girlfriend Viv who's a, an activist in in Blue Jean and next to her it was my partner at the time um, Tina um, so it was really really lovely that um, that they got to uh, got to actually meet each other and uh, and yeah it was just it just felt like you know things had gone um, had gone full circle which was which was absolutely absolutely a lovely lovely moment um, Sue and Paul have touched on this, but um, OK, this Saturday will be 20 years since the repeal of Section 28. And in some ways, it feels like it's a lifetime ago. But in other ways, you know, one of the, there's, there's not there's not much that to celebrate about being old. Um, but one of the things is you see things, you, you see things come full circle and, you know, there's Mrs Thatcher at the uh, Tory party conference creating moral panic prior to section 28 um saying that uh, that that teachers can't be trusted basically and that that young people are being taught that they've got an inalienable right to be gay and i've just kind of put next to that this is Gillian Keegan last week or uh, is Gillian Keegan still in post i don't know i know Suella has gone i was hoping Gillian Keegan might have gone as well but um, anyway, there is she prior to a general election saying, you know, cr again, creating moral panic. Parents have a right to see RSHE content. Yeah, they do. And they can. And there's not a problem here. But we just need to be, you know, I, yes, you know, social media is um, is a force for good and bad. But let's use it for a, as a force for good. Let's let's call out the things that those of us, you know, those 
horrible newspaper headlines that that, that Sue and Paul have, have shared. You know, let's we've now got a voice through social media and let let's use it to to call out the moral panic. You know, when the um, general election debates start happening next year or later this whenever, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that um, you know that the whole trans identity will be a you know it will be a question. Our identities are not a political football. They are not. Nobody has the right to tell us how to live our lives. Okay, and we need to absolutely call this out when it happens, and let's not let history repeat itself. Um, I've got another slide, but I think that's pretty much it. Then I was just um, an ex uh, uh, some of the the um, some of the headlines more recently. Um, I did put in the chat, and here on this there's a QR code because I'm modern like that. I'm not even sure whether that's the right thing or not, and a link to a survey. Paul mentioned that I I do do I do do um, research from time to time, and I'm really interested on the 20 year anniversary of section 28, hearing from anyone um, as to how, what impact, if any, it had on, on you, particularly if you are um, a member of the, the LGBTQ plus community. I'd really, it's a really quick survey, but it would be great to just get a snapshot of, um, of what its impact was um for for any of us that experienced it thank you thank you so much catherine um if anyone who hasn't yet seen blue jean then this week this weekend is as good a time as any to watch it it was a, a brilliant watch and, and also catherine's book um i was fortunate enough to read catherine's book a little bit earlier on and i um i, I emailed catherine saying is it okay if i call you right now because i was so moved by the story shared in that book that i, I needed to speak to you and and, and hear you and, and let you hear my voice as i shared my views on that so i'd really encourage anyone Good. to look into that we'll send out a, um, a follow email to everyone with the resources from schools out as well as Paul's book and Catherine's book so you can find easy links to all of those things. Um, so please um, do visit our website prideandprogress.co.uk on our website you can find the links to podcast episodes with each of our speakers this evening as well as a number of other episodes that are relevant to the conversation we've been having today on our website you can find out about future events that we're holding you can also find the details of our book pride and progress making schools lgbt plus inclusive spaces i want to thank each of our speakers I'm for so joining us this evening you. for their time i want to thank all of you for being here and being part of this conversation um, and i hope that it's a conversation that will continue you if you um after this conversation finishes today if you want to tag us on social media with your comments thoughts or questions we'll share them and then hopefully that conversation can continue there thank everybody so much for making the time to join us then this evening